Hi everyone, I'm Osiris Stephan. And I'm Nina Simmons. And, and we're, we're the hosts host of, of the Love and, and Cannabis, Cannabis podcast. podcast. We started our podcast over a year ago to share our story of how we are helping our son manage his severe epilepsy with CBD oil. Aiden was diagnosed with epilepsy when he was just two years old. And each week we talk with medical professionals, parents, business owners, and other cannabis advocates. All of our guests are so inspiring, but this coming week, on Friday, we have a very unique guest. That's right, Nina. On Friday, October 23rd, we sit down with Bruce Linton, the former CEO of Canopy Grow Corporation and one of the true cannabis titans. Bruce has done so much to improve the lives of so many people, and we are honored that he took time out to talk about the future of cannabis with our listeners. We hope that everyone will tune in on October 23rd to hear a special interview with Bruce Linton on the Love Love and Cannabis Podcast. Podcast. Show. This is Jim Marty from Longmont, Colorado, and I've got my partner up in Chicago, Larry Mishkin. Jim, how are you? And actually, uh, today you find me in lovely St. Louis, Missouri. I came down to visit my father for a couple of days. I thought I might be heading back up north today, but decided to stay one more day since the weather is so beautiful down here. A rare day in St. Louis where it's 70 degrees and the humidity is actually below 50%. So uh, very, very nice. Um, uh, but yeah, we're here. It's lovely. Um, nice to talk to you as always. Uh, you know, we have our crazy frustrating world of, uh, legal marijuana floating around on us and the constant battle between appreciating the fact that our, our friends and, and fellow citizens can walk down to the local store or the local dispensary and pick up their, their marijuana for free while at the same time grappling with the uh the crazy government uh that can't quite seem to figure out or maybe is unwilling to figure out how to roll out one of these programs and avoid all the lawsuits the the, the latest in chicago jim is we we had the awards all the tiebreakers the people who didn't make the tiebreakers filed their lawsuits the governor came back and said fine we'll give you all a second chance to qualify for the tiebreakers so they dismissed their lawsuits. Then a lawsuit was filed by the people that were already in the tiebreaker saying nobody else should be allowed in. That lawsuit is pending. In the meantime, last week, another group that, that apparently it's a trade association that has grown up uh, around the new craft grow licenses, even though they haven't been awarded yet, has filed a lawsuit demanding that the court compel the state to announce the winners of the craft grow licenses, which the state has indicated they're not going to do yet for a while, even though they were due uh, to announce that by July 1st. So, you know, uh, there's a, there's a, a appropriate term that starts with the word cluster to describe this. And, uh, it, it's, it's really unbelievable to see, uh, that, you know, such a big state with such a, a big market and such uh, lucrative potential is going to waste it all uh, and, and, and delay things for so long, you know, with all of these ongoing battles, you know, and like I say, I represent a guy who's made it into the tiebreaker and I represent a number of groups that didn't make it into the tiebreaker. You know, I understand the positions of both, uh, both parties. And, um, you know, for that reason, it's hard for me to take a final position on what's right and what's wrong other than to say that it would have been nice to have a system in place that could have avoided ties or tiebreakers. And that's another story for another day. I don't want to waste a lot of time on that because uh, we are very, very lucky uh, to again have with us uh, really um, this, I think becomes our first repeat guest on the uh, Deadhead Cannabis show and no better person for it to be than Jay Blakesburg. Uh, Jay, again, uh, for those of you who missed our show last time, uh, is a professional photographer, works very heavily in the jam band industry, uh, is the uh, photographer of choice of the moment for Dead & Company uh, and other related Dead members, 
works with fish, works with widespread panic, works with just about everybody and, you know, really has the job that all of us are dreaming would be kind of cool to have so we didn't have to go to the office every day and type reports. Jay, it's great to have you back on the show. How are you doing? Doing great. Thanks for having me. What was all that stuff you were just talking about? Were you speaking in English or some other language? I'm not really sure if I understood anything you were saying. Oh, no, this is it. This is English. This is what happens when the government gets involved in legal marijuana and tries to decide who gets to sell it and who doesn't. Got it. OK, I wasn't sure. Just checking. Yeah. And so Illinois has done a remarkably wonderful job of screwing things up, which, given the fact that it's Illinois, probably shouldn't come as such a huge surprise to any of us. But also given the fact that the governor really supports it and is looking for the revenue generated from that program to save the state from its miserable financial condition, I was just surprised that they really let it sink to the level that it has now sunk, uh, you know, in terms of the delay, instead of these new adult use dispensaries opening up any day now, we still don't even know who's getting the licenses. So it's crazy. But uh, like I say, you know, for the rest of the people out there who can just walk down the street now and buy legal marijuana, they could care less. They're just happy to have a uh, uh, a legal marijuana market. So um, we, we take it in and we move forward. Um, so here's my question for you, Jay. Uh, when we talked to you last time, we know that you do a lot of work with the live music industry, uh, photographs, uh, sometimes you're doing the, uh, the live video feed and, and stuff like that, but it all centers around this idea of there being live music. And for the last seven to eight months, there really hasn't been very much live music. What does a guy like you do during that time? Well, um, not a lot of shooting, that's for sure. Uh, mm -hmm. I actually did get three days of uh, paid work, courtesy of the Hardly Strictly Bluegrass Festival. Nice. Uh, they did a bunch of, they, they, they broadcast an incredible stream uh, uh, two weekends ago, I guess it was, or last, yeah, two weekends ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was phenomenal. Um, and I was on set uh, on the day that uh, Boz Skaggs performed and Lebo, right. hello, and a few, you know, a few other things. Uh, Chuck Prophet, um, longtime Bay Area kind of alt rock guy. It was very cool. It was fun to be shooting. But yeah, I have not done a lot of shooting. So what have I been doing? I have been digging deep into my archives, trying to figure out um, what projects that I could do. So like, you know, I make books, right? I've, 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 I've produced, published 16 coffee table books of my music photography uh, and, um, my last one came out exactly a year ago. It was the Jerry Garcia book. Um, you can still right. find that my website, rockoutbooks.com. And I actually just, um, popped up a cool little bundle package for the holidays. Um, you can get an eight by 10 print and a book together for a heavily discounted price of what those things would cost individually. So go to rockoutbooks.com and check that out. Um, but, um, and that'll just, that'll stay up through the holidays basically. Uh, but I'm thinking like, you know, what kind of books do I want to do? Like what's, what's my next book? I like putting out a book every year, every two years. Uh, and so the one book that I've really been working on pretty consistently is a book that doesn't really have a title at the moment. Uh, the working title is psychedelic icons. And okay. so, um, and so that book is, people that I have already photographed that fit that bill. So Keezy, Leary, Owsley, um, the members of the Grateful Dead, the psychedelic poster artist, Grace Slick, Paul Kantner, Country Joe McDonald. Um, but I actually have done two new shoots for that book. Uh, the first one was a guy with, with a guy named Mark McLeod and Mark lives here in San Francisco and he, um, and he owns and runs uh, the, only LSD museum in the world, I think. Wow. And, uh, it's in his home and uh, he's got these, he lives in the Mission District and he's just got an incredible collection of blotter LSD and other uh, <laughs> uh, that relate to that in his house. And I went over there with my daughter and we spent an afternoon with him and and uh, he's got great stories and, 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 you know, of course he was arrested for conspiracy and, you know, different things like that. He told me a great story about how um, when the, I think it was the FBI, could have been the DEA, had to return all of his um, blotter acid that they confiscated. That's all framed and matted and, you know, on his walls. Actually, when you go to his house, all of the frames on the walls have a little piece of masking tape in the corner with a number on it. And I thought that was just some system he had created. 
But that was uh -huh. all evidence from when he got arrested, but from the FBI, I think it was, um, to keep track of all the different blotter that they had photographed and, and, and confiscated from. And they made him go and meet him at the airport in Oakland. This is way back in 1992 or three or something like that, that they returned it to him. And uh, he had to go meet him on the, the private jet tarmac and they handed him all the boxes with all of his art. And he said, thank you very much. And you should have spent more time worrying about um, who was going to bomb the the World Trade Center oh. the towers than, than, than investigating me. And maybe you could have stopped that. And they didn't like that. And they were ready to shoot him on the spot. Um, but uh, anyway, he got all his blotter acid back. So Mark McLeod, interesting character. You can look him up on the Internet. Um, and uh, so I photographed him. And then the other day, about I think it was two weekends ago on a Sunday, I went down and photographed a guy named Jim Fadiman, doc, uh, Dr. James Fadiman, who is a big proponent of microdosing. He's a, 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 oh, a yeah. he's a very famous um, psychologist. He's never practiced, um, uh, you know, pr in private practice. But um, I photographed him 27 years ago for a magazine story. I had no idea about his history, who he was. It was in 1993 or his wife. I photographed the two of them together down at their house and uh, went back to the same house, I believe, again this time. And uh, it turns out that his wife, Dorothy, who's a very famous filmmaker and made a bunch of documentary films, uh, she was Ken Kesey's girlfriend in 1962 and 1963 and then met Jim Fadiman and then they got married in 1964 and have been married since. And they've had a very long relationship but they're very very important to the whole psychedelic story of psychedelic icons he's written numerous books on the subject and uh so i photographed jim by himself because my photo shoot from 27 years ago was just the two of them and i didn't really realize that she was ken i didn't know she was ken kesey's girlfriend until i met with him the other day but i wanted a solo shot of jim for the book and i'm going to use one of those old shots also but, you know, I, I'm the only person to ever do a posed portrait of Owsley Stanley III, the most notoriously camera shy individual in, in, in uh, you know, rock and roll psychedelic outlaws. I kind of want to call my book Psychedelic Outlaws and Other Cowboys. Uh, <laughs> the problem is, is that there's women in the book. So it's got to be Psychedelic Outlaws and Other Cow Folk, Cow Poke. I don't know. Um, you know, Denise Kaufman, do you know who Denise Kaufman is? Um, in the book, The Electric Kool-Aid Acid Test, she is my Mary Microgram. Oh, really? Oh, my a, goodness. She is a Mary Prankster, and she's in a band called The Ace of Cups that has a new record coming out, I think, this week. And I shot the oh. album for that. I did the, the photos for that. But uh, uh, they made a, they started to make a record in 1967 after they opened up for Jimi Hendrix in the Panhandle in Golden Gate Park after Jimmy played Monterey Pop and burned his guitar um, and changed the world. Uh, the Ace of Cups opened for them in, in the Panhandle. And then they all started having kids and they sort of went on with their lives. And they got back together about, I don't know, six, eight, ten years ago and finished that record that they started in 1960. <laughs> and, 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 yep, and they released it. And now this is their next record that I just photographed. So Denise is going to be in my book, uh, Mary Microgram, uh, Grace Blick. Uh, and we're not really interviewing people for the most part. Um, the person who's writing it is a guy named Nick Merriweather. And Nick uh, was the guy that was tapped to um, uh, run the Grateful Dead UC Santa Cruz archives when they first opened it. Remember when they put a job posting up that said, what? I do. Right. Wanted a you know, PhD, PhD level academic to run, you know, who also was into the Grateful Dead to run the Grateful Dead archives. It was that damn PhD requirement that eliminated me. The, the what requirement? The PhD requirement. The PhD requirement. Yeah. So yeah. And Nick Merriweather got that job and he stayed there for a number of years and then he left. And uh, so Nick, who's this incredible writer, incredible intellectual, incredible deadhead. Uh, he's written a lot of academic journals. He's part of that whole Grateful Dead academic um, conference that happens every year. Uh, he's writing the book. He's writing the text for this book. And he had a bunch of essays written. And uh, and then um, he lives down in near Santa Cruz where the fires were. And lightning struck his house and fried his computers and hard drives. And he lost everything that he wrote. Oh, God. So it was in a backup hard drives, the hard drive, everything fried. Right. So um, and then he spent a week in front of his house with a garden hose with him and his neighbor while everybody else evacuated. 
and they did 24 seven watch and were just hosing their roof down because of all the embers that were falling. Oh my. Now those houses put down in other neighborhoods where the fires are, you know, two or three miles away. And so he, uh, he did that. So where he's, he's trying to regroup. Luckily he hand writes all of his notes. So he's got a lot of post-it notes and he's trying to recreate the book. So that was a book that was going to come out a year from now, but it still might. We, he, if he might be able to pull it off, we'll see. And then, uh, let me jump in for one second. Quick question for you. Okay. How did you manage to get Owsley Stanley to sit with you? So, you know, in the old days, Grateful Dead concerts, if Owsley saw you backstage and you had a, co- a camera, he would run away from you. And he did that once. He saw me. I lifted my camera I, he, from, from 20 feet away. And he immediately put his hand over his face and, 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 and moved and left. And that's a known fact that there are very, very few photos of Owsley. Um, you know, there's a handful from the late sixties, a handful from the mid seventies, and then not very many for, you know, after that. And so I was up at the Grateful Dead warehouse in Novato. This is post front street after they sold front street, and mm-hmm. rented the old Coca-Cola bottling, bottling factory in Novato and, 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 and held out to that for a number of years, right after Jerry died. And Phil was rehearsing with a band and Owsley was in from Australia to do mix sound for a few shows, which I'm killing myself for not shooting with the soundboard. Um, but anyway, um, I had a whole photo studio set up in the, in the back room on the loading dock and, uh, to do a portrait of whatever band it was that he was rehearsing with that day that was going to do some shows. Cause I was photographing all these Phil and French shows and Owsley walks by and I've got big studio lighting going on. And I, this is back in the days of film. So I think it was 99. I saw my Hasselblad, which is a medium format, you know, camera that takes a, 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 a negative that's two and a quarter inches by two and a quarter inches. So a lot bigger than 35 millimeter. It's like you use it for shooting ads and magazine covers and things like that. And he goes, what's all this? And I said, I'm going to do a portrait of Phil when he's done rehearsing. And he looks at me and goes, you want to do a portrait of me? I go, uh-huh. Oh my God. And he goes, oh my God. And he sits down and I think I shot six frames in black and white and, and, and maybe that many in color. And he gets up and walks away. And I'm just freaking out because Owsley had never done that. I'm the only person to do a formal posed portrait with Owsley Stanley the third. Did you get to talk to him at all? For a minute. Um, Not really. Did he give you a couple of tabs just for, you know, as a thank you or something? He did not. But, you know, it's interesting. I was looking through my uh, uh, memorabilia recently, and I came across a business card that he gave me back in the Grateful Dead days of Owsley Stanley with the – Steal your face on it, whatnot. Anyway, so that's so that book uh, that's going to have Owsley in it and Ginsburg and all the you know. There's some beat poets that we have in it. Um, you know, we're just sort of connecting the dots from all these different angles. Like Dr. David Smith, he's the guy that founded the Haight Ashbury Free Clinic. Like we're going to put him in the book, I'm pretty sure, because you know he saw all these acid casualties coming in off of Haight Street in 1967, and he's the only one that did something about it. You know, he was uh, in medical school or maybe an intern and. Um, you know, thought he was going to go on and, 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 and please his father and become a doctor in small town America where he grew up or whatever. And instead, he changed the world with the Haight-Ashbury Free Clinic and later Rock Med, which was, you know, at all the concerts. Anyway, that's just one of my books. Um, I want to do a book on the guitars of the Grateful Dead. Um, I went up to French, uh, to TRI, to Bob Weir Studio a couple of months ago and I shot 21 of Bob's guitars that he played during the time of the Grateful Dead. 21? Uh, 21 different guitars. Yeah. And there's still more to go. Including the pink one? And including the pink modulus. So yeah. Okay. Yeah. Nice. And so that's another book project that says that's a slow one because like a bunch of Garcia's guitars are, you know, locked up in vaults at the rock and roll hall of fame and different places. And, um, you know, there, there was that exhibit, right? The guitar exhibit that was at the Met, it moved to the rock ball and that's where Wolf is. And so, cause of COVID it's all locked down. So I, you know, I don't know when that owner is going to get that one back or the tiger guitar, I think might be there also. So, you know, uh, uh, and then there's some other Jerry guitars, you know, the alligator Stratocaster that Graham Nash gave to Jerry in in 70 or 71 for, for, uh, playing on teacher children. Uh, that one is here in the Bay area and I, good friend of mine owns it so that's gonna be no problem to shoot that also uh jerry's um acoustic martin guitar that he played on festival express and i think also maybe american beauty and working as dead that's here in, in the bay area so that i have access to you know so so that's a that's a project that's going to take a little bit of time and then i'm thinking about doing a book on on music festivals and then uh the cool thing is 
uh, just about a couple days ago. I was down in LA this last weekend because I'm doing a documentary. I'm working on a documentary and I was doing some interviews down there. I've done 21 interviews during the time of COVID. Uh, just me, one on one, two cameras, two microphones. And uh, uh, that documentary is about deadheads and psychedelics and. Um, and uh, how you become a deadhead, and and you know why we're why we're sixty year old fans, and instead of having art on the walls like our parents had on their walls when they were sixties, we have you know pictures of the Grateful Dead or widespread panic or or you know fish or whoever else we love, and uh, um, and so it's a story about my photography and my adventure through becoming a deadhead going on tour, getting out of jail, moving into the Bay Area, becoming me, taking pictures. Are you looking for a career change? I'm Carson Humiston, the founder of Vangst, the cannabis industry's largest hiring platform. I'm so excited because on October 21st and 22nd, we are hosting the cannabis industry's first virtual hiring event. It's two days of great speakers, networking, and most importantly, jobs. We have over 50 cannabis companies all across the U.S. hiring for more than 500 positions. This is the place to go to find your next job in the cannabis industry. To sign up, visit Vanks.com. So I'm doing that documentary, and while I was in L.A., uh, about a year ago, maybe a little bit more at this point, there was an article that showed up in GQ magazine online. You can check it out. And it was an article about Dan Healy. You know who Dan Healy is? He was the long uh, uh, sure. front of house sound man for the Grateful Dead. Decades yeah. and, 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 and a huge innovator in audio technology. Really an incredibly um, famous uh, uh, person. Um, Dan Healy discovered in a crawl space or something like that under his house, some storage space, 500 vintage Grateful Dead t-shirts. Okay. From what era? From the beginning. I think we oh have the very God. official Grateful Dead merchandise item ever. Wow. And so wow. his daughter, Ambrosia Healy, who's in the music business, uh, aggregated all of these T-shirts and a bunch of other memorabilia and brought them down to L.A. to where she lives. And uh, she called me and said, you know, what do I do with this? And she was going to, you know, she's going to sell them because – her dad needs, you know, I don't know if he needs the money, but you know, he deserves the money. He doesn't want them. Sure. So we're going to make sure they get into the hands of deadheads and vintage t-shirts are a hot item, right? I don't know if you know that there's a big market for it. You know, these $10 t-shirts, $6 t-shirts are now, some of them are worth a thousand dollars. Yep. And uh, so anyway, so she didn't want to sell them or do anything with them until we could photograph them. And I said, I'm coming to LA to do some interviews <laughs> for a documentary. Let's photograph the t-shirts. And on Saturday, I photographed 400 Grateful Dead t-shirts. That is so cool. And uh, and while we were doing that, we came across some real doozies. So you guys ever hear of a Grateful Dead concert at Cornell in May 8th, 1977? Absolutely. So he's got four or five never worn Cornell 77 t-shirts. Oh my God. Uh, remember, Watkins, wow. remember Watkins Glen? That too, with the Allman Brothers. He's got about, he's got about five Watkins Glen original uh, t-shirts. Uh, so there's a lot of really intense mm. shit in there that we photographed. So then that's amazing. At the end of the day, after we were ahead of schedule, we actually finished 400 t-shirts by about 5 p.m. instead of like 9 p.m. like we thought. Started about 11, 10 a.m. I think we rolled in. And uh, so anyway, um, she said, by the way, I've got some memorabilia here. <laughs> Um, that that was Dan. So we start looking through these boxes. So I come across a little bundle of ten concert programs from a very specific show. Do you ever see a concert program from when they played in Egypt in 1978? Oh my God! I didn't even know it existed. Neither so, did I. Wow. So, so I took it out and I photographed it. Oh my God! Right. So I've got photographs of the original concert program, which is written in Arabic and English. Um, and uh, so I photographed that. And then, uh, and then um, they had a box of backstage passes, like around four thousand of them. And uh, so we we found all the backstage passes from the spring '77 tour where Cornell fit in. <clears throat> he has a full set of them, like fifteen 
15 of each, <laughs> right? So we photographed all of those in a line, all in order, although I realized we put one of them out of order. I don't know how we fucked that shit up, but we did. <clears throat> you know, we, there, there goes like the 23rd, 24th, 26th, 28th, and we put the 25th down in the, by the 30th. I don't know how. Yeah. Anyway, but, you know, we got all of the all of those, and we just photographed a bunch of random backstage passes throughout the years. Found some Europe 72 backstage pass, or at least one backstage pass. Wow. And I photographed a bunch of his tour laminates. You know, most tour laminates these days are like the size of like a baseball card or bigger. Right. The tour laminates, like in the seventies, were like oh, used to be. No, no, no. They're like no, they were like one inch, one and a half inches by like two inches. Oh, they were like little baby laminates, and uh, in the seventies, and so uh, oh. so we photographed a bunch of Dan Healy and his wife's laminates, um, and then this was this was a holy grail item, uh, besides the Egypt seventy eight fucking tour book, right? Um, when bands go on tour today. Uh, everybody that's on the tour gets a tour book. And in that tour book, it's like, it's day by day. So here's what time load in is. Here's what time sound check is. Here's what time uh, curfew is. Here's what you're doing after the show. You're getting on your bus and you're driving 322 miles for eight hours or whatever it is. Um, you're going to be back to your hotel and the next day is a day off and you're staying your day off and that's te- whatever it is. You're fly- you know, it's got all the information. Um, Dan Ely, had the Europe 72 tour book. Okay. Now, now some of you guys that I'm wow. looking at on this little visual video thing that we're doing while we record have gray hair like me. So you guys might remember what a mimeograph machine is from when we were kids, right? Good smelling. Yeah. This is, you, you get a good high off of it. This thing was, I believe these are mimeograph pages. Okay. In like a brown binder with like a metal clip that it's not punched, no hole punch, no three rings. It's just so we just undid it. I just photographed all the pages, all the band members, all the family members, everybody's names, full first, middle, last name. You know, no ramrod shirt lift like Lawrence Leo shirt lift. Or I think that was right. right. You know, with their passport numbers. Uh, you know, exchange rates in all the different countries, what hotels they're staying in, who's bunking with who, the equipment manifests, you know, it's got to be 40 pages, 50 pages, you know, all mimeographed, all fading. You can barely see it, some of them, you know, but I photographed that. Uh, anyway, so that's what I did on Saturday. So we're thinking that's a book. Yeah. Um, yeah. We're, we're, we're thinking that's a book, you know, and, and I was just actually texting uh, these those folks and saying, I think this has got to be a book that's like the collection of Dan Healy, not just a bunch of random T-shirts, you know. Um, so I, I want to include some of this memorabilia along with the with the the T-shirts because you know it's just the t- and, and Ambrosia or Dan Healy just said you know the merch people or fans or whoever um, you know the promoters. A lot of these T-shirts were promoters. One of them had like a weird thing on the back that said uh, a Corky and Harvey promotion uh, pr- production. I think it was Corky and Harvey. And we didn't know, and we didn't know what that was, and we found out Harvey Weinstein. No way. Hmm. Yeah. Oh God. Yeah, because uh, Ambrosia's husband's also in the music business, and he's like, "I wasn't, I didn't shoot it." And he goes, "Oh, you didn't shoot the Corky and Harvey one? That's Harvey Weinstein's production company when he used to produce concerts back in the seventies." So anyway, hmm. so that's a book project. Uh, I already told you about. Let me um, ask you a question, kind of bring things uh, more up to date where we're at now is what are you hearing about shows for 2021 because you know obviously contracts are being laid about this time for spring tour and well i mean i'm hearing the same thing you guys are like um you know first of all our idiot in chief who doesn't know what the fuck he can do is with you know as far as being a leader of the country besides sending out the secret gestapo police to arrest protesters um, sort of like Nazi Germany, 1937, thereabouts. Uh, because of the lack of um, any kind of um, uh, government oversight, um, we're fucked. So uh, I would say it's a pretty safe bet that live music can't happen next summer. I, I, I'm not a scientist. I'm I'm just a guy. But you know, I read the news. I pay attention. You know. I listen to Fauci. I, I pay attention to science. Um, I just don't see, you know, two of the big trials that were just canceled yesterday for the for the vaccine. Um, you know, I, I don't really know. But so I know I know that a lot of 
I know that a lot of um, a lot of bands have contracts in place for next summer, and they already have backup dates later in the fall before the season sort of ends. And I'm sure that some of those bands have contracts for going into 2022 as backups. Uh, so my guess is, and again, this is a guess. I don't know anything. I'm just a fucking photographer, filmmaker, book publisher. Is that you know we're going to have a long winter ahead of us. That's not going to end with, you know, and, and the thing that's so cool is, you know, there's small concerts happening all over the place now at the end of the season here, the, the East coast is way ahead of the curve. Um, Warren Haynes has been doing shows and pigeons playing ping pong and goose well, and, and Trey's doing his, uh, uh, um, residency you now at the beacon. Yeah, but there's no audience oh. there. I'm talking about shows with audiences. There's been a bunch of stuff going oh. on with small audiences that I hear have been going really well in small backyard shows. And I'm guessing that's going to continue, but I don't see anybody going to a 20,000 person amphitheater in the summer, let alone a 20,000 person indoor venue um, next summer. Uh, I would love for it to happen. I would love nothing more than it for happen, but I'm not holding my breath because I don't want to be disappointed. I hope and pray that by this time next year, um, you know, I hope and pray by this time next month, we have new government leadership. Um, please everybody go out and vote blue. Like your life depends on it. It really does. Um, I'm sorry for any of you conservative people, but our president lies every day. I don't know how you can support somebody like that. Um, he was just officially endorsed by the Taliban and the KKK. So I don't know how you can support that either. Um, um, no, yeah. And so, I'm, you know, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I'm, a, I'm a liberal person and I, I really love my country and he is taking this country in the wrong direction. And I don't think that's the true essence of the Republican Party. And I don't have a problem with Republicans who are the true essence of being Republicans. But um, unfortunately, our president is going in a very bad, bad direction. Um, I'll stop there. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Jay, quick question for you that I, and you touched on it before that I wanted to swing around back to in terms of music for a minute. And we mentioned that the Trey shows are without an audience. And there's been a lot of that lately, right? I know that a lot of people have been performing without audiences. Jay Rad just did a whole series of shows. And, and have you gotten involved in any of the streams of those or anything uh, uh, involved with that? Not really. Uh, you know, I have, um, I photographed the three days of Hardly Strictly Bluegrass. Uh, you know, there's people doing it in their living rooms. Uh, I'm actually going to go hang out with Jackie Green at his house coming up when he does one of his streams uh, just for fun, just because I haven't seen Jackie in a while and I'm, he has a new baby. I want to go see him with me and my wife and and uh, we're going to go visit his family and nice. get, COVID, get some COVID tests beforehand. Um, so anyway, um, you know, and I apologize for my strong opinions about our government, but you know, I, I just think that. Well, you, you still have a right to free speech, my friend. Okay. Anyway. Absolutely. Uh, the first time I saw Jackie Green was at Red Rocks. And if he was opening for, I don't know who, maybe it was the Allman Brothers he was opening for. I'd never heard of it. I said, man, this guy's really good. And he um, he was so young at that time, he had braces on. Wow. Okay. <laughs> and the first time I saw Jackie Green was when he was playing with Phil and friends and they came to do three shows at the Riviera nightclub in Chicago, which is an old, old theater on the North side, right near the uptown, which has been closed forever too. And it's, it's kind of a rundown joint and it was in October and it was significant because the Cubs were in the playoffs, which meant the, the crowd at the show wasn't so great because everybody was running over to see the Cubs, but even still this place was packed. And it was 100 degrees in there. Like they, they had two air conditioning vents in the entire building. For the Saturday night show, they played and played in the second set, went on and on and on. And after a, just an unbelievable help on the way, Slipknot Franklin's, and everybody thought, oh my God, this is it. They're all done. Phil immediately kicks it in to a uh, killer Viola Lee. And you can see, we were close enough, you could see Jackie stopped and looked at him and said, really? And Phil was like, hell yeah, you know, and then later on, the quote I read the next day was, you have to teach these kids Saturday night in Chicago, you don't end early, you keep playing. But uh, it, it just struck me because I, I was impressed by what a great musician he was uh, and how he, you know, just hung with that band and played the dead stuff so well. It was really, it was a treat to see him. Hey, can we end with, um, Jay, um, I was showing you a picture earlier of uh, Jerry all dressed up with a vest on and a white shirt. 
and uh, playing a banjo in front of an American flag. Do you know what the story behind that is? Yeah, sure. I mean, it's a Herbie Green photo. Herbie's a dear friend of mine. Um, Herbie did a lot of work with the band right from the beginning, a lot of portraits. He did, uh, did that very famous portrait of Garcia with the top hat and a lot of, you know, them under the hate Ashbury sign. Uh, that's taken inside 710 Ashbury is part of a series of photos that Herbie did of Jerry and, and uh, in front of that big American flag, which I believe was in Garcia's bedroom, if I remember correctly. But uh, it was shot at 710 Ashbury. Wow. That's good to know. Cool. Anything else? Ask me. I mean, I probably opened a whole can of worms. We'll here. tell you what. In fact, we want to, we want to have you back, and I want to hear some more of your stories, and we'll talk some politics. We'll see who's the president in a few weeks, and uh, love to have you back. Absolutely. One other thing, um, Jay, were you at those uh, those shows in '89 in Hampton when they went as formerly the Warlocks? I was not. No. Okay. I was just reading about it because we just celebrated the anniversary of that show the other day on October 9th. And what I loved about it was, you know, it's one of those nights where they say, oh, yeah, I see this with fish a lot when they do the fish set list. I don't see it with the dead so much because apparently that night for the encore, they broke out addicts. It was the fourth longest um, breakout ever. It was after 1,082 shows the first time that they had played it. Wow. And I love that kind of stuff. You know, Fish on their regular set list, it'll say first time played in 500 and whatever shows. Right. Well, that Addicts is, I mean, you know, Addicts is one of those songs that has always had special meaning. But as we get older, you know, and uh, it's, you know, it's such a song for, you know, that part of our lives. And, and, and my Jerry Garcia book that came out a year ago is called Secret Space of Dreams, which, of course, is a line from addicts of my life and uh so i'll do one more plug if you want to go check out book that book out at <laughs> rockoutbooks.com for signed copies and i've got a special holiday bundle package there you can check out with a print uh but yeah it's a super special song and so you know for them to play it was the last song they ever played for, the, for that for them to play it you know after not playing it for a thousand shows or whatever it was it's pretty remarkable and uh very meaningful moment and uh you know of course now you know one year after losing robert hunter you know, those songs that are so profound and uh, have so much meaning. And, 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 you know, I always say that, you know, the songs of the Grateful Dead, as, as we get older, they all take on different meanings. You know, those songs mean something to us when we're in our 20s and something else Absolutely. in our 30s, and something else in our 40s and so on and so forth. And, uh, uh, you know, it's, those are, you know, some of the most profound lyrics. I, I interviewed Blair Jackson uh, for my documentary film, and I, I interviewed a guy named Bill Bentley. Mm -hmm. Um, who used to work for Warner Brothers Records, uh, Neil Young's publicist, you know, in L.A. on my recent trip down there. And that was one of the things we were talking about is just, you know, these lyrics, these profound lyrics of, of Hunter and, you know. And, and Speaking of which, I've been, I see, you know, you were talking about your daughter. How old is your daughter, Jay? She's 24. Okay. I have a, we have a 22-year-old, and he and I have been listening to Must Have Been the Roses quite a bit, trying to unravel that song. Right. And the question we have is, is Annie passed away in that song? Is he singing about somebody who's not with us anymore? I, that's how I always read it, I guess, you know, later had some of the roses. Yeah. But I, I, you know, so, but, uh, my daughter, my daughter actually, here's another little plug. My daughter also just, um, uh, started a new Instagram page for me. So I have my regular Instagram page, which is just Jay Blakesburg. Well, my daughter just started one called Retro Blakesburg. And uh, she only, and she, 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 she's curating it. And it's only photographs uh, that I shot on film, nothing digital. Oh, okay. Um, so, uh, so if you're interested in checking out a new Instagram page, go to Retro Blakesburg. Um, and um, and uh, check that out there. So, I'm going to make a plug for our son, Jack Marty's band. They, he's in a fish tribute band called Kings of Prussia, and they are actually getting gigs. We're going to go to one tomorrow night. Awesome. My new puppy's name is Wilson because he is the king of Prussia and the Duke of Lizards. So there you go. All right, everybody. We run a little bit long, but this has been a fascinating conversation with Jay Blakesburg. And uh, like I said, we'd love to have you back maybe in a month or two. And, uh, Talk some music, talk some politics, talk, talk some marijuana laws and regulations. So, all right, everybody, this is Jim Marty thanking Jay to being with us today. Uh, Larry, why don't you sign us off? 
I will, Jim. Thank you so much uh, from lovely St. Louis. Uh, first of all, thank you again to our uh, great host, uh, our guest and friend, Jay Blakesburg. Uh, always fun to have you on the show. Great stories uh, uh, that the rest of us, you know, just we don't even know the stories exist, let alone, you know, what the stories are. So uh, it's always one, wonderful to learn new things about uh, our favorite band and some of our favorite stuff. Uh, we appreciate good political enthusiasm, and uh, we're very happy that you could join us today. Uh, to everyone else, have a great week. Stay safe. Enjoy your marijuana responsibly, and we will talk to you soon. Thank you very much. Thank you.